Well, turn with me, if you would, to uh, the Gospel of John, where we find ourselves in chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 12 to 25 together. Uh, as you turn there in your Bibles, I always find it helpful to be reminded of John's purpose in writing his Gospel. Uh, knowing John's purpose is helpful not just in understanding the narratives as we walk through them, but it's also a great opportunity to consider the application and to us as we consider John's intent. You can find that in John chapter 20, verse 31, where it says, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. And so as we walk through the narratives, even as we walk through the cleansing of the temple, as Jesus in righteous anger drives out the money changers and and all those who are doing business there, uh, we're going to consider what that means about who Jesus is. Now, as we turn to chapter 2, verse uh, 12 together, uh, Jesus has already begun his earthly ministry. Uh, And as we've been presented to who Jesus is, we've talked about his, his interaction with John the Baptist, who declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, we had the interaction and the testimony of the, t- of the disciples. We were introduced to five of them already, and we talked about how these five disciples declared, this Jesus is not just a man or a prophet, he's the Messiah. That's why they decided to follow him. They called him the Messiah, the Son of God. At one point, one, one disciple says that he is the one foretold in the Old Testament law and prophets. And so Jesus, by the testimony of John the Baptist and the disciples, is not just a man or, or a prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. In chapter 2, we were introduced to the first miracle. Jesus turns water into wine, which demonstrates Jesus has the power as the Messiah to do a miracle like this. And even in his compassion and grace, doing this miracle in the midst of a wedding when they ran out of wine and God in his grace and mercy provides that which is lacking. Um, And today, as we continue to walk through the text, we get to see him cleanse the temple. As we consider, what does the cleansing of the temple and the manner in which Jesus does it tell us about him? And so let's go ahead and turn there. John chapter 2. Let's go ahead and read it together, beginning in verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they didn't stay there for many days. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Uh, Today we get to dig into this incredible portion of the Gospel of John chapter 2 as we consider Jesus cleansing the temple and what it tells us about him. And my prayer as we we prepare our hearts for the word is that we would consider if, if anyone's an unbeliever is seeking to discover who Jesus is, that you'd open your heart and mind to to consider, is Jesus a man, a prophet, or is he the Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Does he truly have authority to do what he wishes in the temple? And does he have the authority to cleanse it and do it on his terms? As believers, as we prepare our hearts, it's a wonderful opportunity to strengthen our faith 
in the one in whom we trust, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, as we walk through our text, what does the text tell us about Jesus as we walk through it? First, we see that Jesus exercised his authority to cleanse the temple in verses 12 to 17. Uh, Jesus has authority, as we're going to see in this text, to do what he wishes and to cleanse the temple on his terms, and we get to read about the cleansing. But before we get to the cleansing, Jesus, uh, we hear about his travels. Uh, verse 12 serves as a transition from the wedding in Cana to his journey to Jerusalem, where he's going to make his way to celebrate Passover. And the text tells us in verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum. Now, if I could show you a map and you were to take a look at Galilee, you would see that Cana is located in Galilee, but Capernaum is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and that's north. And so, yet it says here, it, it goes down to Capernaum. And so whenever you see down to Capernaum or up to Jerusalem, we're not talking about direction, we're talking about elevation. And so whenever you go up to Capernaum, even though you're going northeast to get to Capernaum, which is maybe 18 miles away, you're going down to Capernaum in terms of elevation. And whenever you go to Jerusalem, from whatever direction you're going or traveling, you're going up to Jerusalem. Uh, so in the next text, you're going to see in the ver next verse, when it says for the Passover, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he goes up to Jerusalem, even though he's traveling south. And so Jesus, he makes his way to Capernaum. It's almost like a family reunion. He's got mom there. He's got his brothers, and he's got these only five disciples that he's already picked up that we've read about in chapter 1. Now, it's interesting to note here, at least in the Gospel of John, this is the last time we see Jesus' mother mentioned until the crucifixion. And so here at this point, this is Jesus spending time with his mother, his brothers, it's interesting to note as well, we don't hear about Jesus' father, Joseph. The last time you hear about uh, the father of Joseph is when Jesus is, uh, or Jesus is 12 years old and Joseph uh, is with him in Luke chapter 2. And so many students of the scriptures just simply believe that, G that Joseph at this point has died or passed on. Uh, and so he, Jesus is with his mother, he's with his brothers, he's with his disciples, and they don't spend many days there after spending time at this celebration, this wedding in Cana. And then verse 15, we continue to see the travels of Jesus. It doesn't tell us at what time or how long it was until he celebrated the Passover, but it says now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now it's important to consider what the Passover festival and feast was like in Jesus' day. Uh, the, as a Jewish male, you were required, if you were in the distance of Jerusalem, in a certain distance, to attend three feasts or festivals every year. It was Pentecost, it was Passover, and it was Tabernacles. And so during this feast, I mean, the, the population of Jerusalem increases greatly. From 200 to 300,000 to some estimates go up to 2 million. Uh, uh, Josephus, he tells us, over 2 million. So whether it's oh, that much or, or uh, that's a little bit too high, maybe a million, whatever it may be like, I mean, when people come and celebrate Passover, not just with the men, but with their families as well, this is a big event. This is a busy season. And as we're going to see, as they go into the temple area, they're going to worship the Lord. They need to buy sacrifices in order to make sacrifices. And so it's pretty busy. Lots of money can be made during the feast, and the Passover is one of them. Uh, it's important to note what the celebration of the Passover feast is. The Old Testament, of course, we hear about where the Passover comes from. As the Jewish people uh, find themselves in bondage to the Egyptians and led by Moses uh, through a series of plagues, the final plague is one where all the firstborn children will, will be put to death or the firstborn boys will be put to death. But for the Jewish people, they were to shed the blood of a lamb. Take that blood and, sh and, and, and put it on the doorposts of their home and as the angel of death uh, came by, it would pass over, hence the feast and the festival, Passover, as God's people were delivered from the oppressive hand of the Egyptians. 
But it's interesting to note, as we've already said, as John the Baptist declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what a fascinating thing that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the the Word become flesh, has come into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, and he himself is the Lamb of God. He himself is the fulfillment of the Passover feast. And here he is as he kicks off his ministry here in Jerusalem. And so it's quite the event that's going on here during this Passover feast. And so we get to see the travels of Jesus as he exercises his authority to cleanse the temple and makes his way there. Secondly, we see the discovery of Jesus in verse 14. It says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Now, we know that Jesus has been in and around Galilee his whole life. Um, We know that he's from He's from Nazareth, and so he's been to the temple on many occasions. He's just kicked off his his earthly ministry, and so he's been to the temple for these different feasts and festivals. So it's not the first time that he's seeing what's taking place in the court of the Gentiles as money is being exchanged, as sheep and and, and livestock is being sold for, for exorbitant amounts of money. And he's seen it before, but now it's a little different. And the reason it's a little bit different is because he's now kicked off his ministry. He's now prepared and ready to present himself As more than a man, he is the Messiah. He is the anointed prophet, priest, and king, and he exhibits his authority to cleanse the temple and do it on his terms. And so as he enters into the temple, this is what he sees. You can can hear the sounds of the livestock. You can smell it a bit in the temple courts. You know, if you've ever been a part of a a church uh, play around maybe Christmas time. Sometimes, you know, they like to have live animals on stage. You ever been to a church where they have live animals and you never know what's going to happen, you know? Animals, they're going to do what they do and you're going to smell it if, if they end up deciding to go to the restroom right then and there. And on not many occasions, I don't know if Twin Rivers has ever had some live animals in our church, but, you know, it's one of those things that you might want to lay some things down on, on, the, on the floor to make sure we can clean it up properly. Imagine the temple, a holy place. The purpose of the temple was not to be a place where you sell things. and uh, You could sell things. The, the problem is not selling the sacrifices. The problem is misusing the temple. The temple is a house of prayer, as Jesus is going to say in a moment. It's not a house of merchandise, a house of business. In Isaiah 56, 7, it says, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. The temple is a house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. In Matthew 21, 13, And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So we're reminded of the purpose of the temple as Jesus walks in. This is the court of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles couldn't enter into the rest of the temple. Uh, you walk into any further into the temple, it says you, you walk past this. If you're a Gentile, you die. This is absolutely not allowed. So this is the only place for the Gentiles to pray to God and worship God in the temple, and they're using it in order to sell sacrifices and to exchange money. As I said, the problem is not selling the sacrifices or exchanging the money, but misusing the temple for the purpose for which it has been appointed. So Jesus, he walks into the temple, and there he sees it as he's seen it most likely on many occasions. And there you smell the livestock, and you see the money changers and everything going on. And then we see the reaction of Jesus. Now, when we talk about Jesus Uh, You can see him in different ways here. He exhibits his righteous anger. He walks into the temple at the beginning of his ministry and the temple is being misused. And we know who Jesus is. He is the one who exercises authority to cleanse the temple. And the reason is because he is the Messiah. That's what we're considering together as we're walking through this gospel. And so as he walks in, you get to see his reaction But I want you to know it's calculated. 
Because as you enter into ver the next verse, verse 14, it says in, in verse 15, excuse me, it says, when he had made a whip of cords, so you can almost picture Jesus as he walks in and he's seen this on a number of occasions, but today's the day for him to cleanse the temple, presenting himself as the Messiah who exercises authority to cleanse the temple on his terms. And he grabs some rope, grabs some cords, and he begins to fashion them because he's getting ready to drive out these money changers, drive out the livestock. And when it's the right moment, it tells us he made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the, chain, the, the changers' money and overturned the tables. And so picture Jesus walking in. He's got his cords and he's driving everybody out. Driving the livestock out, taking the tables and, and tossing them over, taking the money changers. And the reason these money changers are here is because you couldn't use foreign currency within the temple to buy these sacrifices. You had to exchange it. And so there was a tax on that. So they're making money off of that. And he's pouring out all the money. He's throwing over the tables. And then he turns to those selling the doves and he says, take these things away. What we get to see here just in that statement and in his actions is Jesus exercises his authority to cleanse the temple. He's claiming in this statement his authority to do what he wishes and to do it on his terms. He says, do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Not only does he exercise his authority, he claims his authority on the basis that this is his father's house. Notice he doesn't say here, our father's house. He's claiming a unique relationship with the Father as the second person of the Trinity, the Word became flesh. He says, this is my Father's house. And he says, do not make my Father's house a house of merchandise. In other words, this is not a business. The purpose is to be a house of prayer. This place is a place of worship. And Jesus comes in and he finds the misuse of his temple and the corruption of the worship to be unacceptable. What we get to pause here for a moment and consider is that God, when you take a look at this text, is a holy God. And he has holy standards. In the Old Testament, you see him said that, that as I am holy, you be holy. Holiness refers to simply being set apart. Talks about holy ground. You know, when Moses sees the, the burning bush, the very presence of God, you could call it the Shekinah glory, is evident by the light that shines forth. Holy means to be that which is set apart. The temple is that which is set apart for the worship of God. As you read throughout the Old Testament, the kind of worship that God finds acceptable is not, sacri is, is not superficial worship. It's heartfelt worship. At certain points throughout Scripture, whether you're in Isaiah or you're elsewhere in, in the Old Testament, you'll see um, God's def saying, you know, I don't desire your sacrifices. Get right and purify your hearts. I'm not interested in ritual or religion. I, I'm, I'm interested in a circumcised heart. And then that's reflected in, in the way you live and the way you worship. He's not interested in... In superficial worship, he's interested in sacrificial worship and true worship. And then we see not just his reaction, but we see in verse 17, uh, the disciples of Jesus and their reaction. It says, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Um, that's a psalm, Psalm 69, verse 9. If you go back to Psalm 69, that's a messianic psalm. The disciples, these five who have followed this Messiah, who know the Old Testament scriptures, who know Psalm 69, call it to mind and say, this is the Messiah who has zeal for the house of the Lord. He has passion for the purity of this temple, for the house of God. Let me tell you this. When Jesus comes on scene, he's not just a reformer of Judaism. He's the Messiah. When Jesus comes on scene, he's not interested in simply changing things. He's taken over. 
He is the king, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. And he comes to take over. Now, he's going to come the first time as a suffering servant to die for the sins of humanity. But the second time, he's going to come as a conquering king. Nevertheless, he is the Messiah. He is the one who has come to take over. And in these verses, 12 to 6, 17, we get to read about Jesus who exercises his authority to cleanse the temple. If I could take a moment to, to answer the question, what does the cleansing of the temple tell us about Jesus? It tells us that the authority exercised by Jesus is that of the Messiah. Now, if Jesus was not the Messiah, he certainly has no right to come in and do what he did. <laughs> he has no right to, to claim as, as this unique position, as the second person of the Trinity, the, the Son of God, this is my Father's house. Drive all of this corruption and this unacceptable um, way of, of handling the house of the Lord, which would be a house of prayer. This is not a business around here. He demonstrates his authority accordingly. So if I could give us just a few takeaways here in our text. The, the first one is this. Jesus takes sin seriously, takes corruption of worship seriously, and, and, and deals with it on his terms. Uh, and this is a reminder for us as we take a look at how, how Jesus cleanses the temple and, and does it on his terms that we as well should take sin seriously. We should take superficial worship seriously and then deal with it on God's terms. How do you take sin seriously or the misuse or superficial worship seriously? It's by means of dealing with it at the cross. Now, in Scripture, we get to see uh, that the, the church is described as the temple, and then we as believers are described as the temple. And I want to apply that specifically to us. First in Ephesians 2, 19 to, 21, to 22, it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We're talking about the church. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Uh, what we first get to see is that the church is referred to as the temple. Obviously, God's people, uh, we are indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in a moment, we'll talk specifically about what it means for us to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what does it look like for the church as the temple of God to take sin seriously or superficial worship seriously and then deal with it on his terms? The first thing I'd like to talk about when it comes to our church is to submit to Christ's authority over his church by aligning with his purposes. What's God's purpose for the church, which is described as a temple? When you get to see, when you read scripture, you get to see the great commission and the great commandment. You know what the church's purpose is? It's to make disciples. It's to go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things I have taught you. That's the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is found in the great commandment. What's the greatest commandment? Is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. What's the purpose of the church? To love God, love people, and to make disciples. When the church functions according to the design that God has set for it, that's what God has called us to do, and that's what God is, who God has called us to be, a church uh, that is indeed a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we should submit to God's plan and purpose for his church. The church should never be uh, limited to becoming a social club. It should never find itself uh, driven politically on one side or the other. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't talk about political issues. When Scripture deals with an issue that may be political, we deal with it because it's biblical. Nevertheless, we're, we're not on, uh, on the Republican side or the Democrat side. We follow Christ in Him crucified. He is the King. We follow him alone. And so when it comes to the church, we, we recognize what our unique purpose is. Uh, secondly, the manner in which the church as the temple of God should take sin seriously and deal with it on his terms is by submitting to Christ's authority 
over his church by following his word. I think it's interesting to note how God deals or instructs us to deal with sin in, in, within the church. And one of those ways is communion, the Lord's table. It's a unique opportunity for the people of God to examine their hearts so that we don't partake of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, then we're going to skip to verses 31 to 32, says this, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for if we should, would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. But the opportunity we have as a church to purify our hearts and to get right before the Lord and be the church who God designed us to be is whenever we partake of the Lord's table to examine our hearts. It's not something we just do and we partake of the, the elements, the bread that represents his body and the, the fruit of the vine, the wine or the grape juice that we drink that represents his blood, but that we take a moment to examine our hearts, to get right before the Lord. And if any way we need to get right with one another, we do not partake of the Lord's table unless we do it in an unworthy manner. We get right with a brother or sister in Christ accordingly. Worship should not be superficial. God takes worship seriously. It should be heartfelt. There is a genuine understanding of, of who we are in relationship to God. And so communion is an opportunity to submit to Christ's authority for his church, and, and so is accountability. In Matthew 18, it speaks of if there's a, a sin within the church body, our brother and sister in Christ should be in sin that we should go to the other brother or sister and talk to them face to face. You know, chat with them. Say, hey, I just want to, as a loving brother or sister in Christ, come alongside you and, and, and what do you think of this scripture in terms of, of your life? It talks about a series of steps that are to be taken so that we, we honor God within the local body, within the church. Talks about if, if they still don't turn to the Lord, you take two or three witnesses. Now, this is not like one step after the other. I just talked to my brother, and so now I'm going to go get my two or three witnesses because they didn't want to repent right here and now. I mean, there's a, a time period in which you allow the Holy Spirit to work in the heart of that individual. And then if, the, the, if it's needed, you, you take two or three witnesses and the purpose is always to restore the brother or sister in Christ and you give the Holy Spirit time to work in the heart of that believer. And then if they still don't repent and turn to the Lord, then ultimately the end is, is, is you, you almost, ex, well, you excommunicate them in essence and the purpose is in order that they might be restored so that they would experience what life without Christ within the church community is like, and they would be driven back into repentance and a right relationship with the Lord and with his church. So we get to see the church is indeed something that is described as the temple, and so we should consider that and submit to the authority of the Lord accordingly. And so I want to invite us in for some discussion, and it would be, be this. What are some specific ways we can pray for our church, Twin Rivers Church, and guard against any impurity from entering in. After all, communion is something we take part in. Accountability is something we should take seriously. God takes sin seriously and deals with it on his terms. So should we. What are ways that we can be praying for our church, Twin Rivers? Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. So praying for the leaders of the church, especially in terms of character and the, and the qualifications of what it means to be an elder, a pastor, or a deacon of a church. Yeah. 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 So praying for... Yeah. Praying for sound doctrine and praying that the church locally, especially our church, is not impacted by the culture or different trends that you may put it, but biblical in all things, certainly. Yeah. Anything else? We'll be praying for our church. Yeah.
yeah, yeah. So praying for our church families, our church, mar- the marriages that make up our church, uh, praying for the singles who make up our church, just everyone in between. Amen. Yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah, Anna. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, praying for the next generation, our children, those within our church body who we get to minister to, and uh, just praying that they have a strong foundation in God's word, as there's so much out there that may try to take them over the gospel and over God's word. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Anything else we can be praying for our church here at Twin Rivers? Yes, Steve? Yeah, yeah. so to continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, not just get to know God, but make him known uh, in our individual circles of influence, but also as a church as we get to, get to go out and uh, make disciples by sharing the gospel with the lost around us. So yeah, that we'd be committed to that. And so uh, first, in terms of the application, wanted to talk just for a moment about the church who, who is described as the temple in Ephesians 2, and also talk about believers who are described as the temple in 1 Corinthians six nineteen to 20. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Wow, this is exciting, especially when you think back to the Old Testament times and, and, and you think back to the temple and, and how... Uh, Gentiles couldn't go into a certain place within the temple and, and, and there was the holy of holies where the priest would enter in and provide a sacrifice for, on behalf of the people once a year. And you get to see the very presence of God within the temple. And then you hear these words and it says, or do you not know that you as a believer are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Wow, it makes you take a step back and consider what have I been watching? What have I allowed to go on and ruminate in my mind? What are the kind of people that I connect with and who influence me instead of me influencing them for the gospel of Jesus Christ? When I consider that my body is a, is a temple of the Holy Spirit, it, it, it impacts the choices I make and the way I live and the type of thoughts I allow in my mind. Whom you have from God and you are not your own for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Uh, And so, what does that look like for us as believers who are described as the temple of God to take sin seriously and deal with sin on his terms? Uh, I'd like to suggest first by submitting to the cleansing that God provides each one of us. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, opens our eyes to see Sin in our lives, in our minds, in our relationships, things that shouldn't be present, and then we deal with them accordingly. What does it look like to deal with sins on God's terms? Deal with them at the cross. You receive forgiveness at the cross. We also receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who indwells us to live a life that honors and glorifies him. Hebrews 12, verse 6, also verse 11, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And scourges every son whom he receives. Verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Well, no one enjoys discipline in the moment. Even when it comes to difficulty, suffering, hardships, pressures we feel on all sides, and yet God can often use those Uh, to get us on the right path, to cleanse us and to to demonstrate areas, times when we're selfish, you know. I don't know I'm selfish until I have to serve the needs of someone in hard times. You know, I don't realize certain uh, sins about me until I feel the pressures of life. Never thought I was an anxious person or I worried much until things got difficult around me and I realized just how anxious and worrisome I can become. Submit to God's cleansing. And secondly, take time every day to examine your heart. Psalm 139 is an incredible text. Verses 23 to 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. 
God, I know my heart is deceitful above all else. And so, God, I pray that you would expose those areas in my heart that demonstrate sinful attitudes that lead to sinful actions. God, daily, I need to uh, uh, focus on, 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 on who I am and what I'm doing and how I'm responding. Verse 24, and see that there is no wicked way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. You and I are a temple of the Holy Spirit. We're a temple of God. God takes sin seriously, and so should we. We shouldn't, when the thought comes into our mind, ruminate on it or, or think about it. In the moment, when we have a way out, we take the way out immediately. There are certain relationships in our life that don't belong. God, in his grace that he guides us in and empowers us, can, can help us cut off those relationships that we don't need to be a part of. As we ask God to examine our hearts, to examine our minds, examine our marriages and our families and the way we respond to things, Lord, we as a temple of the Holy Spirit want to honor you and we want to be holy as you call us to be. And so what we get to see is, is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. It's interesting, when Jesus moves into your life, he begins to move things around. And, and and as we're going to see, these Jewish leaders don't really like that. First, we saw that Jesus exercised his authority to cleanse the temple. Secondly, we see that Jesus defended his authority to cleanse the temple. We pick up in verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do these things? The Jewish leaders go up to him and they say to him, who do you think you are? By what authority do you say the things you're saying? Uh, now, Jesus, I'm sure they know it, it, the Messiah is a, is a fulfillment who, of one who will cleanse the temple. Um, if I take you back to Malachi chapter 3, it says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. And like a launderer's soap, he will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Verse four, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old as in the former years. And so I'm certainly sure that these Jewish leaders knew that it wasn't right for them in the court of the Gentiles, which was a house of prayer and a place of worship, at least for the Gentiles that they were limited to. They knew that it wasn't right to be exchanging money and currencies in that area. It's a house of worship. It's a house of prayer. They certainly knew that you shouldn't be selling animals within this area for sacrifices to be made. You could go outside of the temple courts to do that. That was perfectly fine. But what they asked Jesus is not in order to learn about who he is. It's simply to challenge his very authority. And by asking this question, they're saying, who do you think you are? By what authority do you stand? In other words, it's like, Jesus coming in, moving things around and saying, I can do what I wish because this is my house because this is my father's house and I will do what I wish and cleanse as I wish and do it on my own terms. You know, it's kind of similar if you were to invite me over to your house. You would say, hey, I want you to come over to my house maybe Friday and I come by your house and I enter in and I have a seat on your couch and you say, hey, make yourself at home and you go into the kitchen and you grab something, maybe you grab some drinks, and then I look around your house and your living room and I say, I don't like the way the furniture looks in here. And I start moving your furniture around and I'm like, why do you got your TV here? It makes no sense. Why do you put it on this wall? And then you come out and you walk over to me and you're looking at me kind of funny and you're saying, who do you think you are that you can just walk in? I don't care if you're a pastor. You can't walk into my house and move my furniture around like you want because this is not your house. By what authority would you do that? They're basically asking this to Jesus. By what authority do you have to, 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 to drive out the money changers and to kick out the livestock and do what you wish? Jesus is the Messiah. That's the authority that he has. But listen to how Jesus answers them. And he doesn't give them an answer to benefit them. He's going to give an answer and provide an answer that benefits his disciples, but it won't be an immediate benefit either. 
It tells us this, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They're thinking, he's talking about the temple we're in. This is the second temple, Herod's temple. Herod came along prior to Jesus 16 years before him and he was expanding the second temple after after they come back from exile, after the Babylonian captivity and the temple is being rebuilt, Herod comes along and, and before Jesus and the temple continues to, uh, more things begin to be done on the temple. The temple won't be completed completely until about 70 AD and that's when it gets destroyed. Nevertheless, this is the temple they think they're, he's speaking of and he says, destroy the temple. He really doesn't give them an answer. I'm not gonna give you a sign. But here's the answer I give you, and it's not for their benefit. In three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? This guy's insane. But verse 21 clarifies what he's talking about, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, and so the 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 response that he gives doesn't benefit anyone. It benefits the disciples specifically. And it benefits them not till after his death and his resurrection. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said to them that they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. John says, I write these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John says, take a look at the testimony of, my, of these disciples. Take a look at these disciples who were eyewitnesses to this Jesus, who made this prophetic statement that, yeah, that you destroy the temple, and he's speaking of his body, in three days, within three days, I will raise it up again. Let's note this for a moment. Sometimes it says that Jesus raises himself from the dead. Other places you see in scripture, it says that the Father raises Christ from the dead. Can I say this? It's It's a Trinitarian work. When Jesus rises again from the dead, it's the work of the Father, the the Son, and the... Uh, Jesus says here, destroy the temple in three days. I will raise it up again. It's a Trinitarian work of God. Isn't it interesting how Jesus says, says he's talking about his body? What he's basically saying is, as you come to sacrifice here and and you buy these sacrifices and then you uh, and then you and then you bring them before the Lord and in sacrificial worship, he says, I'm the temple now. I am the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I am the temple. I am the one who, 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 who draws you into the very presence of God. Jesus is going to say later in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. You want to draw near to God? You don't have to go through this temple of stone. Jesus says, look at me. Go through this temple a flesh, fully God and fully man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus says, I am the temple. Destroy it three days later, I'll rise up in newness of life. First thing I wanna just tell us in terms of who, who this tells us Jesus is, is first the, the, the growing opposition of Jesus reveals him to be the Messiah. Remember John 1.11 told us as within the prologue, it said he came to his own and his own did not receive him. This opposition is not going to decline. This opposition is going to grow. This is the beginning of the three-year ministry of Jesus. But as he draws nearer to the day of his death, the opposition of the Jewish leaders and the people is going to grow more and more. And this opposition is evidence indeed that Jesus is the one who is the rejected stone. And he is the very one who's going to die for the sins of humanity. And all who put their trust and their faith in him will have life and have it in abundance. And so we're we're reminded here within the opposition that's growing that Jesus is indeed the Messiah who he claimed to be. And so I just want to open it up for discussion. As you have conversations about Jesus with others, what reasons have people given you for why 
They are not yet ready to receive Christ into their life or reject him altogether. Anyone want to share? Just as you have conversations with others, what are some reasons folks share? You know, I'm not yet ready to make Jesus my Savior and my Lord, or, you know, that's just not for me. I'm just going to reject him altogether. Yeah, go on. Oh, yeah, yeah. You hear that a lot. Like, I, I need to get right before God. I need to clean up my life. I need to, need to clean up my, uh, my language, the way I speak, and, and, and think that before you come to Christ, you have to clean yourself up, but we can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they deny the authority and the inerrancy of Scripture. Just see it as a, another book. Yeah. Yeah, any, any others? Yeah, Nikki. Yeah, so they don't see their need for Jesus. Uh, life is pretty good. They're enjoying their, their lives, and so they, they don't need Christ and him crucified. Yeah, Steve. for the week. Yeah, Adam. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, always lead to heaven. Yeah, all roads lead to heaven. You find your path. You can find it through Christ. I'll find mine. Yeah, you hear that a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's unfair, in essence. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, not the best... Uh, Christians who, who've, who've testified of Christ, and so they've driven folks away as well, certainly, yeah. I mean, I talk to many folks who have experienced hurt, pain, suffering in their lives, and even as they grew up as believers or as Christians, at a certain point in their life, they say, in reality, how could this good God allow such suffering, such tragedy to happen in my life? I, I can't follow this God. Um, and so when you hear just some testimonies of atheists as well, uh, if you get down to the nitty-gritty of it and you hear their testimony and their stories, often it comes to that place where... Because atheism is, you know, not very logical. Agnostic, agnosticism, you can kind of consider, okay, there might be a God out there, but I'm certainly not going to deny that God exists. But atheists will come out and, and, and very pridefully say he does not exist because there's a hatred towards God, and that's what you often see by those who claim atheism, something's happened to them and they hate the God that they don't believe in and sometimes you experience that as well. But yeah, many different reasons why individuals reject God or at least what they say. Ultimately, we know that their heart is unregenerate. Their eyes are closed. They have ears, but they cannot hear. Eyes, but they cannot see until the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ shines forth in them, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Uh, but the greatest argument, even as we see in our text, as Jesus gives an answer to his critics and those who object to him, the greatest argument for Christianity and its veracity is indeed the resurrection. Jesus says, you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it. You want to deny the resurrection of Christ? Go ahead and and try. Try to prove it false. Go out and do your research. 
And it's amazing what you're going to find. And so we get to see first as we consider what does this cleansing temple, the cleansing of the temple tell us about Jesus. Jesus exercised his authority to cleanse the temple. Jesus defended his authority to cleanse the temple. And then thirdly, in verses 23 to 25, Jesus continued his ministry after cleansing the temple, demonstrating himself, continuing to do so as the Messiah. Verse 23 says this, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. Verse 23, that shows us that Jesus has done some public miracles. Uh, this is not just a private wedding in Cana that we saw when Jesus turned water into wine for a group of people who have been invited. This is during Passover when hundreds of thousands of people have gathered together and Jesus is demonstrating signs and miracles and people believe in him. What a wonderful thing. What a fascinating thing is Jesus does these things to demonstrate that he's not just a man. But he is God. But notice the next verse and what it says in verse 24. It says, But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and he had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. These people believe in him but it's a superficial faith. Jesus sees the heart. He sees the depth of their hearts and their trust in him, but it's a simple, it's a superficial faith because they see the miracle, but they miss the message. Whenever you see Jesus doing a miracle, he's not simply trying to impress people or to draw a crowd. He's not like the political leaders of our day in which you you, you do what people want you to do. You do whatever it takes to, to draw a crowd. He's not interested in drawing a crowd or having people, even his critics, understand what he's saying. He's come to seek and to save that which is lost. He is the Messiah. He's come to fulfill a specific purpose in mind. And there are some who see the miracle, but they miss the message. And it's a very sad thing when you come and you see Jesus and you, you hear what he's done and even the gospel, but you don't come to a place of complete surrender. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross and he must follow me. This is not after Jesus has died. When you think of the cross, you're thinking of a humiliating death on a cross, the death of a criminal. And Jesus is saying, if you want to follow after me, if you want to be my disciple, it's not just being a student of mine. It's not just being a learner. It's me, it's meaning. It means that you lay your life down for me. Take up your cross, even if that means your death, and follow me wherever I go, follow me. This is the call that Christ has on our lives. Christianity is, is not a come to me and I'll, and I'll make sure you're comfortable. Come to me and I'll make sure you got plenty in your bank account and, and your health is well and everything's good and well. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'll forgive you for your sins. And if you don't experience rest in this life, you'll experience it certainly on the other side. But we get to see the unique purpose of Jesus who sees the heart and desires for us not to be superficial in our faith and our worship, but genuine and authentic, knowing that Jesus is not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He has the authority to cleanse what is his. And so today, this is an invitation. If you are his, you know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, to turn to your master and say, Jesus, cleanse me. Examine my heart and find if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. Lord Jesus, I deny myself. I'm not my own. I've been bought at a price. You died on the cross for my sins. I belong to you. 
I desire to take up my cross, and even though that sounds difficult and per- perhaps even impossible in my own strength, I know through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, if that should ever come to pass, that you will provide me everything I need to do what I need to do to serve you and be faithful to your cause, and I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. And so what do we get to see about Jesus who cleanses the temple? He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He has the authority as the Messiah to do as he wishes. And today, if you don't know this Jesus, if you haven't fully gone all in and surrendered all to him and said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior and my Lord, today is the day of salvation and saying, Jesus, I I know who you are as you have shown yourself to be And if you're not yet convinced, we'll be continuing to read through the Gospel of John as we consider that Jesus is not just a man or prophet. He's the Christ, the Son of God, who provides life eternal, the abundant life now in his name. Here we pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, uh, for what it teaches us about who Jesus is. He's the Messiah, the anointed prophet, priest, and king. Father, as we consider the specifics and the application to our lives, we, Father, come before you and we surrender our hearts to you, our minds to you. Surrender our marriage to you and our families to you. Father, we do pray uh, as a church that you would examine our hearts. Father, each one of the things are, uh, we confess our sins before you. We confess them as sin. We agree with you, God, and we turn from them. We pray, Father, in a moment like this that that you would give us the reminder daily that we deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow you, that we are not our own, but we've been bought at at a price. Father, I pray every day that as we pursue holiness, your Holy Spirit would produce in us the needs that we have. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for uh, what you have done in our lives. And we pray that you'd continue to, to do that work and bless us as we finish up this week. We pray your blessing on our time together and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.